Thank you very much, Floy, and um, welcome to all those who uh, have come to listen to my story. <clears throat> Just over five years ago, I matriculated in the Crosslands Retirement Community, and it wasn't long before I discovered that the major curriculum was lifelong learning. And I began to reflect on my career and my journey, and I am going to share that personal story with you. It's a part memoir, part and in the involvement in the actions and passions of our times, and part my discovery of how the Internal Revenue Service the IRS succeeded in taxing my conscience. It has been wisely said that you make your path by walking. Let me repeat that. You make your path by walking. So now let me take you along on my personal journey. One of the first steps was in the 1940s. I was living in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. I was going to high school. The country was immersed in World War II, and there was the possible threat of invasion in the air. One day in a discussion in our social studies class, my classmate, Alice Hornaday, posed me a question. She said, Robin, if a German soldier came marching down the main street in Swarthmore and you had a gun, what would you do? I reflected briefly and then I said simply, I would not shoot him. And as you can imagine, all bedlam broke out in the class that morning. But I have been thinking, where did that public expression of uh, refusal to commit violence, where did that come from? And I have to turn to the wonderful nurture of my dear mother, Jean Harper. She was very active in the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. This is the country's largest and oldest uh, women's peace organization. And I surely had heard in the household conversation words such as nonviolence and international peace and uh, disarmament. But I can now look back and see that even more central than this nurture was the fact that my mother offered me unconditional love. Now this brings to mind a phrase or two from the Shaker song, Magic Penny. Love is something if you give it away, give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. Oh, it's just like a magic penny. Hold it tight and you won't have any. Lend it, spend it, and you'll have so many they'll roll all over the floor. Love is something if you give it away, give it away, give it away. Love is something if you give it away, you end up having more. Well, stepping further into my story, <clears throat> I found myself at a 
junior college in California after high school. Uh, it was a work study experimental proje project. And uh, while there, <clears throat> I uh, was exposed to a very meaningful course of great books. We started with Homer and we ended with Freud. I now realize it was Western civilization we were studying about, but that was a big piece of my uh, broadened education. I also was studying about the lives of great people like Albert Schweitzer and Mahatma Gandhi. And this was deepening my understanding of life and its travails. Following my two years at Deep Springs, I decided that rather than go on immediately to finish my college education, I would take a gap year. And I sought out uh, several youth projects of the American Friends Service Committee the Quaker organization headquartered in Philadelphia. For a good portion of that year, I was in the interns in industry group, living in South Philadelphia and going out and finding jobs in industry. That summer, I uh, found myself at a a county mental hospital in northern New Jersey, where the uh, young people that were gathered that there were being trained as attendants to care for the mental patients. And uh, I was impressed with the fact that the philosophy of the uh, <coughs> hospital, as well as the American Friends Service Committee, was that in caring for mental patients, you do not ever use violence. And in fact, the policy of the hospital was if any attendant struck a patient or used violence, they would be fired uh, immediately. Also in Philadelphia, there was the wonderful institution Fellowship House. Marjorie Penny had founded it and it was uh, offering many community opportunities to people of color as well as white people. And it was my first exposure to interracial activities. Fellowship House had a choral group and uh, it uh, eventually morphed into Singing City, the famous Philadelphia choir. And I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to uh, participate in that uh, choral work. So after my gap year, I found myself uh, a junior at Cornell University in Ithaca. And by this time, I had uh, been absorbing more of uh, uh, the uh, life and work of Quakers learning about their testimonies and their emphasis on practice as well as faith, recognizing that if you have a strong faith and you act on it in practicing it, then the practicing strengthens your faith. It's a mutual enrichment experience. But I want to say, and I ask the first panel to be put on the screen, I, I was uh, deeply impressed by the Quaker peace testimony. This was a statement that early Quakers, George Fox and others, presented to King Charles II of England describing their approach to life and religion. And I wish to share with you some of the essential wording from that testimony. 
We utterly deny all outward wars and strife and fightings with outward weapons for any end or under any pretense whatsoever. This is our testimony to the whole world. The spirit of Christ by which we are guided is not changeable so as to once command us from a thing as evil and again to move us unto it. And then this testimony ended with the stirring admonition. Therefore, we cannot learn war anymore. And this brings to mind an important stanza from the famous uh, Negro spiritual down by the river. Gonna, <clears throat> gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside, down by the riverside. I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside and study war no more. Oh, I ain't a gonna study war no more. I ain't a gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't a gonna study war no more. I ain't a gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. What singular is that the concluding statement in the peace testimony of Quakers and the essence of this stanza of <clears throat> down by the riverside talk about studying or learning war. And it became clear to me that it's not something, war is not something that you're born with. It's something that you're taught. It's something that you learn from your society. And that was an important insight. May I have the other next panel? <clears throat> While I was at Cornell, I had the opportunity to participate in a an international conference on world peace sponsored by the Quakers. And the Quakers had in their wisdom invited a resource person from India, Dr. Sushilya Nayar, who we learned was a personal physician to Mahatma Gandhi. And in the intense discussions that we were having with her, I raised the question, Dr. Nayar, how can us young people work more effectively for peace and social justice in the world? And she offered a profound statement of advice that has challenged me and been a touchstone for me ever since. She said, speak the truth as you see it and then act up to your convictions. While at Cornell, we were in the midst of the Korean War, and young men were ex expected to register with their draft board and receive a classification, even though they would receive student deferment as long as they were a full-time student. So I uh, proceeded to uh, communicate with my draft board in Mount Holly, New Jersey, and uh, asked them to send me the special application that uh, was available to those who wished to be considered conscientious objectors to all war. I received this application and spent midnight hours penning my developing concepts of spiritual matters and 
religion and faith and describing the various work experiences I had had and ways in which I had demonstrated my faith uh, in activities. The draft board was looking for expressions of sincerity about one's beliefs. Well, I sent this in and my draft board in their good judgment decided they would send me the CEO application uh, uh, classification uh, without having me come down to have a personal hearing before them. So I was still a, having student deferment and I went on from Cornell to uh, a year at Haverford College in an experimental program uh, for a master's degree in social <coughs> in uh, in uh, social and technical assistance. But when I finished my academic work at Haverford, I was uh, then subject to the draft. And conscientious objectors, I'll use COs for shortening it, COs were ex expected to put in two years of alternative civilian service in the health, in the interest of the health and uh, of the nation. So I uh, was uh, encouraged to find a suitable work so that the draft board wouldn't have to scurry around and find a job for me. And I went to the uh, headquarters of the American Friends Service Committee in, in Philadelphia and uh, came across a chap who was in charge of the work camp program, a chap named Alan Bacon. Now, for those of you at Crosslands who've been here for a while, you know who Alan Bacon was, a beloved member of this community who sadly passed away a few several years ago. Well, Alan I uh, was interested in seeing if he could find something for me to do for two years, and he offered the suggestion that there was a, a new program in Indianapolis, Indiana, which involved self-help housing, where families would get together uh, and cooperatively build houses for each other. This was many years before Habitat for Humanity was established, but it's the same principle. Putting in your labor as sweat equity and then uh, having uh, a home to live in, uh, uh, upgrading your, your housing. So I applied to Flanner House Homes, which was the settlement house uh, sponsoring this program, and I was accepted. And I was the first of several COs that went to uh, work with this housing project, providing leadership. There was a, an international Quaker work camp there in uh, the neighborhood in Indianapolis. And uh, I uh, was uh, <clears throat> fortunate enough to reside there initially. And one of the uh, participants was a lovely lass from Germany. And Maurice and I got acquainted. Uh, and uh, it wasn't too long before we decided to get married. So th those two years uh, at Indianapolis encompassed uh, my completing my alternative service, getting married, and, and by the time we left uh, <coughs> Indianapolis, we had a daughter. And my next step was uh, a year in Richmond, Indiana, where a 
an Earlham College professor was working with several other professors to help each other build homes. And I worked with that program. And then I took a big step uh, in 1956, and uh, we traveled to Germany, my first trip abroad. And I wanted to see if I could uh, find some meaningful work in Germany and learn the culture and language of my wife. But that uh, didn't work out. And so we came back to the United States and I was uh, drawn to uh, apply for a job with Concord Park Homes, where one of my college, Haverford College uh, mates was uh, the administrative assistant. Now Concord Park Homes was special. It was a, a new development of 129 homes, which were open for purchase by people of all backgrounds, not just whites like in Levittown nearby, which was completely white, but for people of color and people from other uh, cultures. And this was attractive to me because it was extending my experience with uh, cooperating with the families of color. And we uh, decided that we would move there. I was uh, uh, accepted on the staff as one of the construction workers. And uh, we bought a home. This uh, concept was called open occupancy. And it was a pioneering effort to make housing more available to people of color in the post-war period. In these years, I was becoming more and more associated with the peace movement. There were marches and there were vigils and teach-ins and lobbying in Washington and I also ran across people who were conscientiously refusing to pay income tax for war purposes. And this appealed to me because I realized that when I sent money to the IRS, a lot of that money would go for military purposes, including the development of nuclear weapons during the Cold War. And that was completely against the grain. So by 1958, I was prepared to take a major step on my journey. I decided to refuse to pay income tax to the IRS. Some war tax refusers would uh, figure well about 40% uh, of the income tax goes for peaceful purposes and 60% for, for uh, military purposes. That is of the discretionary budget. And that was the case with the uh, warring that the US was involved in. But I figured that if I paid 40%, then 60% of that 40% will go for war. So any amount that I would pay to the IRS would help to fund nuclear weapons and uh, the deployment of nuclear weapons and the Cold War. I was mindful of Gandhi's clear understanding of how social change takes place. He says you, you must express a protest by saying no, but then you have to have a constructive program that counteracts the uh, <clears throat> problems caused by the uh, impl implementation of uh, protest. So you need to have both a yes and a no 
And I was touched by the famous quote from Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. Well, I wanted to see change in the world, and I figured along with my dear wife that if I were to refuse to pay money to IRS, I couldn't keep the money. I needed to redirect that money to uh, causes and programs that were helping to build a more just and peaceful world. So I instituted what I called my alternative peace tax. And in 1960, accompanying a letter that I penned to the Commissioner of Internal Revenue, as well as the President Eisenhower and my senators and congressmen and uh, the Atomic Energy Commission head and the Secretary of State. This letter described what I was doing and why, but I accompanied it with a four-page manifesto. You can put up the next panel, Ernie. The title of this manifesto was Wars Will Cease When Men and Women Refuse to Fight. And the end of it said wars will cease when men and women refuse to pay for them or profit by them. Within this four-page manifesto in which I described my alternative peace program and the dangers of nuclear weapons threatening the extinction of the human race, I offered a pledge. Let me read it to you because it became central to my activities. I renounce all war and will never support or sanction another. I shall do what I can to oppose preparations for war. I shall strive to make my daily life more loving, more nonviolent, and more truthful in thought, word, and deed. I shall devote my resources to creating conditions of peace. Now, I want to uh, say a little bit about building for peace. I think that peace is a verb. It's not a static state, but it's a <clears throat> series of conditions that conduce human <clears throat> society to live in peace. Things such as everyone having a decent roof over their heads, all people having fresh water to drink, and having adequate sanitation, and opportunities for their children to get a decent education. Another condition of peace is how the local community or society handles disputes with uh, nonviolent, uh, non-coercive ways to uh, satisfy the uh, needs of the community, and so on and so on. I, I should also mention that, that everyone would have adequate medical care. Those are conditions of peace. Well, continuing my journey, it went on this track for 46 years, from 1958 to 2003. And I, every year, when I submitted my 1040 IRS 
uh, form. On the back side, I would place all the monies that I had uh, distributed to organizations around the world. And that total was exactly what I had calculated to be my uh, legitimate tax burden. So my tax return, my tax form showed a zero tax owed. And along with my 1040, I submitted a letter to the person who would surely be auditing my return, explaining why the, those numbers appeared as they did and what, I, what uh, motivated me to want to work for peace and not support war. And I recall very vividly that one year during the height of the Vietnam War, when so many Americans, scores of thousands had been killed, and perhaps even millions of Vietnamese had lost their lives. I penned in the words of the famous Bob Dylan song, Blowing in the Wind. How many times must a man look up before he can see the sky? Yes, and how many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry? Yes, and how many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Over those 46 years, I contributed uh, uh, <clears throat> financial resources to 83 organizations. And I viewed it as annual nonviolent civil disobedience. Or in the immortal phrase of John Lewis, I was offering good trouble to IRS and the government each year. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details of how I managed to uh, refuse my income tax to the government for 46 years. But I do want to say that my prime accomplice in this, in addition to pro bono lawyers, was my dear wife. She was a citizen of Germany. She had a green card, so she could live in this country uh, <clears throat> permanently. And she was truly concerned that if she had joined me in this illegal activity of war tax refusal, that she might be deported. And so the decision was made that she would have separate and normalized tax affairs with the IRS. When we needed a car, we bought it in her name. When we wanted to set up a savings account for our children's education, it was in her name. So that was one way that we coped. I also found uh, sympathetic employers and uh, including Pendle Hill. And uh, the last 20 years of my employment was self-employment as a house doctor. And when you are self-employed, you have much more control over how your finances are handled. But now I want to share with you a vision of this journey. It's a metaphor of a tree. 
which symbolizes the full sweep of my alternative service in all these different ways. There's a root system, there's a main trunk, and there's spreading branches. Now the root system is fed, is feeding my tree from the essence of the peace testimony and of the wisdom from Dr. Nayar and the content of my pledge of 1960. And the sap that of determination that runs from these uh, nourishing roots goes into the main shaft of the tree, which symbolizes my conscientious objection to all war and my adherence to nonviolence in all my actions. Now the spreading branches that form the canopy are depicting my expanded range of <clears throat> alternative service in the interest of peace and justice. These uh, branches have designations. Some of them are nuclear weapons or Black Lives Matter, the environmental issues, voting rights, women's right to choose, and the climate red alert that has just been uh, imposed on us. For example, Black Lives Matter. I'm saying no to police profiling and killing of blacks. And in the opposite way, I'm saying yes to reimagining law enforcement and community policing. Under, with the branch labeled women's right to choose, the no is prohibiting, laws prohibiting abortion. And the yes is to insist on rights to an unfettered opportunity for family planning. And so on, one after the other, there was a no and a yes, and uh, new branches are growing all the time as we cope with new problems. An opportunity to continue my alternative service came when I received uh, these several large stimulus checks from the federal government in the last year. And I decided that I would take those thousands of dollars and redistribute them just as I had my alternative peace tax to causes that are currently working in constructive ways. I I, I uh, totted up about 50 organizations that received my stimulus check. Now I want to leave you with a vision for the future. One that encompasses a concept of world citizenship. And I am calling it the global Marshall Plan. You remember the Marshall Plan after World War II when the United States generously helped Germany and Japan recover from the devastations of the war 
and uh, help with uh, ha housing and f food supplies and and building up uh, uh, e economic activity. And it was a gesture, uh, an important gesture that I'm sure had much to do with the fact that in the last 70 or 80 years, we have not fallen into another global war. Well, it's been calculated that about one quarter of the money that all the nations of the world are pouring into the military for weapons and armies and so forth, that one quarter of that sum would be sufficient to provide a, a better life for the entire human family and helping to con <clears throat> to uh, uh, bring forth conditions of peace. Again, housing and uh, sanitation and medical care and and uh, civic uh, uh, <clears throat> comedy, uh, all the things that I've mentioned before that are conditions for peace. But immediately before us stands an opportunity to launch this. And the United States is tentatively uh, dabbling in this. And that is the distribution of vaccine throughout the world. If the United States and other nations that have capabilities for producing this vaccine against the COVID-19 virus were to collectively pour billions of this va vaccine throughout the world, we could tame this virus. And it would be just the first step in a global Marshall Plan. Let, let me conclude with uh, re reading to you a, a <clears throat> poem. Ernie, you can put it up on the, on the screen. A poem that I wrote in 2017, while part of the poetry group here, entitled Season Perspective. I have journeyed along many winding pathways in every season, but now summertime has passed and my autumn is approaching. Leaves from my life work are falling, drifting down on a gentle breeze to the ground of my being, embodying colorful deeds that once flowered above on the branches of my family tree. Now I am learning to navigate this changing weatherscape. Is my sojourn encompassed by fall and proceeding to winter's final end? Or mayhap ahead of for me lies a bonus springtime with rising sap fueling buds of new deeds eager to bloom. None can foretell. Just as the roots of the evergreen tree of life are nourished by the infusion of everyone's life's deeds, so do I trust that certain of my life deeds will serve as nourishment for the springtimes of those who follow. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God as our mother, brothers and sisters are we. Let us walk with each other 
in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. To take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Thank, thank you so much for stepping along with me on my journey. very much, Robin. We've learned a great deal from you. Ernie will, will um, feel the, the, uh, the discussion that you follows. Um, I hope that you will make a chance to have a question for, for um, Robin. Carol Ann Baker, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Carol, you are muted. Carol Ann, you I'm are muted. Myself. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, as a fellow member of the Society of Friends, I wanted to let you know of a, and remind, let some know that might not have heard this, and others who for whom it's very familiar, the founder of our society, um, asked us to let our lives speak. I think, Robin, you have let your life speak and continue to do so. It's a great inspiration. And as I think about the steps of life that we are in, approaching our end time at some point, we should realize how important it has been and is to continue to witness to your deepest beliefs and convictions. Um, I have watched you do that over the years, actually, um, from a distance. We didn't know each other well. But what you have done has helped others to think carefully about how they will choose to witness the peace, whether it be in the way that you have or in many other ways that those who should not have um, considered civil disobedience, but have other ways that they've tried to advance those causes. So thank you to me and to others. Bless you. Thank you for those kind comments, Caroline. Brigitte Alexander, next please. Robin, did you, did you ever have a response from the IRS is one question. And the second question is, I think there are other war tax resistors in this country and have, I think there's an organization and I would wondered whether you could comment on that organization. Yes, there is an organization, the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee. It uh, reached its zenith during the Vietnam War. It's now smaller in numbers, but has a newsletter and has annual conferences. And I, uh, more people keep coming to the realization they can't pay for war and they want to have workshops and and uh, study sessions of how to do it. Um, Did you hear from the IRS? Yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I was uh, in federal courts a number of times with the help of pro bono lawyers. Uh, I was in the uh, U.S. tax court for an, a, a number of tax years where I was the plaintiff uh, and uh, the government was the defendant. But I also was in district court 
where IRS took me to uh, attempt to seize uh, assets of mine. And I, twice I prevailed in, in district court, uh, which is perhaps uh, unique in the war tax refusal movement. I, the issues uh, are complex and I, I could go into them. But the other thing that I want to say is that uh, after I started receiving Social Security, uh, IRS had been given the power uh, to uh, uh, garnish 15% of Social Security payments off the top of those that they deemed to be uh, irre, uh, irresponsible taxpayers. And so for eight years, from uh, 2003 to 2011, uh, IRS skimmed 15% for my Social Security. But in 2011, for whatever reasons, they decided to stop doing that. And ever since then, I've been receiving my full Social Security payments. So th those are a, a couple of uh, times when I was uh, <clears throat> uh, challenged uh, by IRS but they never succeeded in uh, getting me to pay them any money or put even a dime on the altar of Mars. I, I want to say that IRS attempts to coerce people to pay taxes through fear, fear of auditing, fear of uh, garnishment, fear of seizure. Well, by the time I had lost my fear of IRS, I was free to continue my witness and, and uh, steam full speed ahead. Isabel Olmsted, please unmute yourself. Uh, basically, uh, the questions that I had were the questions that Brigitte had, but I do want to say that uh, your talk was very inspiring, Robin. I, I met you before you before you came to Parkhurst. In fact, when I came to the United States in 1957, uh, and, I, and I think about a year after I was there, I was here. You know, my late husband was a member of, of Providence Friends meeting, and I already had heard about you. But this guy, he went and paid his taxes. Well, maybe I don't know what year it was, but eventually I heard about you. And then, of course, I have to make it through all the means. But uh, your talk was very inspiring, and I continue to be inspired by all you have done, Robert. Thank you very much for everything. Manya Bean? Yes, um, thanks, Rob, Robin. Thank you so much for this good, good story of trouble that you told us, of good trouble. I want to tell you that if there is anything there's a bad audio here. Do you, is there any way to fix that? Do you see here an echo, a big echo? No? Yes. Okay, well, anyway, what, what I wanted to ask Robin, Robin is that I think that the biggest, biggest problem is the people who make weapons. It's the people who want to have perpetual wars all over the place, all over the globe constantly because that's how they get rich. And that, how, who's gonna stop that? I think that's the biggest, the biggest problem. Uh, you know, the, the warmongers who make weapons because war is so profitable for them. Yeah, well said. I don't know the answer. Okay. Caroline Baker, are you hand, have a question or just left over from last time? You are muted. left over. I, I don't have okay. another question. Okay. Uh, Brigitte? No question. Uh, I don't have any. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, I, I have one thing to, to uh, simply suggest, and that is that in talking about the vaccination 
and the fact that it, if it was released to globally, um, the the uh, pandemic would be kept under control. At this point, it, it's not under control, and more and more uh, situations like the Delta uh, um, alternative is are going to to surface so that this this could go on forever um and the suggestion that was given to me was that the patent should be released so that other countries can can actually um produce their own their own vaccines um that's something i think we might think about and possibly write to our senators and Congress people about, or at least tell them about, suggest it. Um, but of course, Pfizer and uh, Johnson and Johnson and the uh, German one, the, the English one, they'll have to somehow be be encouraged to to release the patents. Just a suggestion. <laughs> So I guess with that, we will thank you very much, Robin. If there are no further questions. Um, I, I can make one more comment uh, in relation to those that uh, Brigitte has offered. There is an international movement of vortex refusers. Um, it's been going every two years since uh, in the 1950s and uh, they meet in different countries every two years i've been to uh, ones in in england and germany and in washington dc and uh, there are about a dozen or more countries where there are movements for uh, to try to uh, prevent the uh, tax money from being used for war uh, it's uh, an idea that will not die. It's also an idea that whose time has perhaps not yet come. But uh, we can always uh, hold out hope that uh, the better angels of uh, the human family will prevail. Well, thank you. And with that, I think we will say goodbye. Goodbye.